Well, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for joining us today, and especially Gertrude. Uh, before I introduce Gertrude a little bit more, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. Uh, one is that uh, our organization, Engineers for a Sustainable Future, is in the process of, uh, of um, formalizing our membership email list. Uh, right now, we've uh, had email anyone who has uh, attended one of our presentations, we call it a, a member, which is pretty loose. And uh, as we uh, go out for grants, we want to have a better uh, listing of members. So if you're interested in becoming a formal member, uh, if you could put that on the chat here and uh, just say, uh, give us your, your name and uh, telephone number and email list. Uh, there's no there's no dues, all that, but that's not saying at some point we might uh, ask for financial support uh, from from our members. Uh, after Gertrude's presentation here, then we'll have a few minutes for to input uh, from our members. Uh, suggestions on uh, well, presentations, uh, uh, questions, uh, what have you. And uh, so it's not necessary to stand, uh, stay, on, stay on for that, but we sure appreciate uh, getting input from, from you all. And uh, there'll be one professional development hour granted for today's presentation. So Gertrude uh, Villaverde and Gertrude, if I've Mispronounce that, please correct me. Uh, uh, as an honors bachelor of science in energy system engineering from Oregon State, and she's a certified energy manager. She works for Energy 350, and she supports contracts with technical analysis and production efficiency for industrial facilities and efficiency upgrades in existing build, buildings. And she's also active with uh, the Columbia River Association of uh, Energy Engineers. Uh, Gertrude, if you uh, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Mike, for that introduction. Um, and thank you to Engineers for a Sustainable Future for having me today. Uh, like Mike said, my name is Gertrude Villaverde. I work at Energy 350. I'm an energy engineer there. Um, but today I'm here representing NEO with a presentation on VHE DOAS called Efficiency uh, or Efficient HVAC Design for Healthy Indoor Environments. Um, and we can make this a, a, a casual presentation. If you've got any questions, you can just go ahead and shout them out or if you'd like to wait until the end, that's fine too. Um, just whenever you see fit to ask those questions if you've got them. Um, yeah, so let's get started. First of all, who is NIA? If you've never heard of NIA before, NIA stands for the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. And this is a regional alliance of more than 140 Northwest utilities and energy efficiency organizations um, spanning uh, the states of Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana. Um, some of the folks who are part of this alliance that you might know of are um, Energy Trust of Oregon. Uh, we also have Bonneville Power Administration. Um, so NIA has been around since 1996, and basically they're tasked with securing energy efficiency for their alliance partners in the region. And how do they do this? So they find new energy efficient technologies and services, um, and they can either be pre-market or new to the market or within the US or in other countries. So basically they find these energy efficient technologies and services, and they're funded by their partners to work upstream to drive adoption of those energy efficient technologies. And what do I mean by upstream? I'm, I'm talking about installers, designers, manufacturers, uh, manufacturer uh, representatives and, and um, distributors. And so their partners represent more than 13 million energy consumers in the four Northwestern states. What is Better Bricks? So NIA's work spans both uh, the commercial and residential sectors, and they provide a lot of resources about energy efficient technologies, including for HVAC, uh, lighting, pumps, windows, um, and more across a variety of building types. And they do this through their Better Bricks platform, and you can find them at betterbricks.com. 
So whether you design, build, manage, sell, or operate commercial buildings, Better Bricks can provide resources and tools to incorporate energy efficient technologies into buildings. Um, so they're a great resource to have. Some of the things that we'll be talking about today, um, why high performance HVAC? Why does this matter? Um, what is a very high efficiency dedicated outside air system or VHE DOAS? Uh, what are some of the benefits of this system approach? And finally, I'll share some results from a few of our demonstration projects. So why high performance HVAC? Why do we care? Why does it matter? Well, we spend about 90% of our lives indoors, uh, be it at school, in the office, uh, in retail spaces, in homes, grocery stores, et cetera. Um, so we spend 90% of our lives indoors and we like to be comfortable, we like to be safe, we like to be healthy, right? Um, and so heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems are key to enabling that safe, comfortable, and healthy environment. But as we all know, it comes at a cost. HVAC is very expensive to design, install, maintain, and operate. And it turns out it's a significant portion of energy costs of commercial buildings. As you can see, HVAC combined, account, combined accounts for uh, over 50% of total building energy use in commercial buildings in the US. So it's important for businesses and building owners and operators to get HVAC right. Um, there's design guidance literature out there for HVAC, but that usually focuses on cooling. But here in the Northwest, uh, space heating is our dominant end use. And then even more so of an afterthought is ventilation, especially in small buildings. Um, but from this, uh, Figure here, you can see that nationally, 11% of commercial building energy use is for ventilation. Um, and by comparison, it's also on the order of 20 to 30% of HVAC energy usage. So ventilation is significant, not only for indoor air quality, but for energy consumption as well. So what is this VHE DOAS or very high efficiency DOAS system? The HE DOAS is a full system approach that delivers heating, ventilation, and air conditioning to commercial buildings. So this is kind of a, a simplified schematic of what a VHE DOAS system would look like. And there are four key components to a VHE DOAS system. So firstly, you've got a fully decoupled ventilation um, and heating and cooling system. Let's see if I can get my laser pointer up here. Um, can you all see my laser pointer? that show up? Good. So you've got a dedicated ventilation system here, um, and it's completely decoupled from a heating and cooling system. So neither the controls um, nor the ducts cross for these two systems. Um, the second key component to a VHE DOAS system is the high efficiency heat or energy recovery ventilator, HRV or ERV. And I'll probably use those interchangeably in um, this presentation, but we're talking about um, uh, an energy recovery ventilator with greater than or equal to 82% sensible effectiveness. Um, so what that might look like in a building, like let's say it's uh, you've got a set a temperature set point of 70 degrees inside a space. Imagine that's us in our office, and this is this is our office space. Um, so we've got a set point of 70 degrees. Let's say it's 30 degrees outside. With this um, high efficiency heat recovery ventilator, um, this outgoing 70 degree air, this stale air, will actually pre warm this incoming 30 degree air and deliver um, air that's about 64 degrees to the space. And so, this uh, heating and cooling unit doesn't have that much of a lift to maintain that 70% or 70, um, 70 degree set point in the room. The third component is a high performance electric heat pump system. I think we're pretty familiar with that. And the fourth key component for a VHE DOAS system is the right size heating and cooling system um, because you're going to recover a bunch of energy from this um, heat recovery ventilator. Um, we can actually downsize the heating and cooling system. Let's talk about the, each one of those components a little further. 
Uh, so that first key component is fully decoupled um, ventilation and heating and cooling system. This approach allows both systems to be controlled and optimized independently. Um, so that means that the ventilation system can be scheduled and controlled for occupancy. Um, so it provides flexibility in that way. And on the other hand, the heating and cooling system delivers comfort conditioning and controls the temperature of the different indoor zones um, without regard to the ventilation system. Um, and in this way, each one of those systems can provide the critical function that they're intended to. Well, what about partial coupling or partial decoupling? Um, so this is a very popular approach, but um, often it's not done thoughtfully. And what I mean by partial coupling is if, if you can see here when ventilation air, um, so you've got this 100% outdoor air ventilation. Um, when you've got this ducted into the return side of a heating and cooling system fan coil unit, um, indoor air quality can suffer. So this is um, a partially coupled system because you, you have this ventilation air coming in on this backside of this fan coil unit. Um, so this is exactly what's happening on one of our systems that we've been monitoring. Um, of course, we wouldn't call this a VHE DOAS system, but uh, we did monitor this system uh, so we can see the effects of partial cooling or partial coupling uh, for this office space. Um, so it was a pretty typical VRF with ERB design. Uh, the ventilation air from the ERB was ducted into the return side of the VRF fan coil unit. Um, and we placed um, energy metering uh, devices in this system. And we also had CO2 sensors in a few spaces around the building. Uh, the one that I want to focus on is this, this corner office here. We had a CO2 sensor um, in this corner office. Uh, this figure um, in particular shows the, the fan coil unit power that served those eight office spaces. And then this is that CO2 concentration from the far corner office. And um, you can see here that in the morning when it's cold, that fan coil unit is, uh, is cycling on almost every hour. And so CO2 concentrations um, remain low in the room. Um, but once it starts getting warmer during the day and that fan coil unit is, isn't cycling as often, or even in the early afternoon when it's not cycling at all, um, at least not for its um, high speed cycles, you see that uh, CO2 concentration actually peaks above 2000 ppm in that corner office. Uh, we actually have other data for this, um, for this particular office. And um, so this wasn't the worst day. We, we actually saw on some days when the fan coil unit almost didn't run at all, the CO2 concentration reached above 3000 ppm in that corner office. So it's pretty clear that in this type of design partial coupling, um, ventilation isn't effectively being delivered to all of the spaces. Okay, so we have that second component, the high efficiency HRV ERV. Um, so there are a variety of HRVs and ERVs that boast that greater than or equal to 82% um, sensible effectiveness. Um, you see five of those manufacturers here on the screen, and you can see a whole list of those compliant products um, at betterbricks.com. But what are those minimum requirements for high efficiency HRV or ERVs? There are four of them. Uh, the first one, of course, is that um, minimum 82% sensible effectiveness for thermal efficiency. Um, NIA also requires a fan efficacy of at least 1.3 CFM per watt um, at certain design conditions. Um, and a low internal leakage rate, so an exhaust air transfer ratio of less than 3%. This is really important for NIA since um, uh, one of uh, NIA's main goals for this type of HVAC system approach is high indoor air quality. Um, and the last minimum requirement is a heat exchanger defrost control without recirculation. And again, that's for the, um, for the high indoor air quality requirement that NIA is going for. Uh, these are parts of the table that you can find at betterbricks.com that show the different manufacturers and um, their models that uh, have gone through third-party testing and they have um, been proven to be compliant for VHE DOAS. So there are over 70 specific models from six manufacturers. 
Um, and you can see that they range in size from 250 CFM all the way up to over 42,000 CFM. So there really is like a, an HRV or ERV size for any, for any building. And across these products, there are three main heat exchanger technologies. Uh, there are the rotary wheels, which Green Heck, Semco, and Swagon use, um, counterflow plate type heat exchangers, uh, which is what's used in the Ventacity and Oxygenate um, units. And then we have uh, dual core reciprocating heat exchangers, um, which right now only TempF offers. Um, but this list isn't stagnant, and NIA is open to working with any manufacturer who has units that they'd like to get on this list. So if you've got, um, if you if you represent any um, manufacturers, or if you know of any units um, that might make the cut, and you'd like to see if they can uh, make our compliant product list, um, please reach out. We'd love to get them tested and add them to our list of compliant products. All right, so um, I just want to go into those three different um, heat exchanger technologies a little more. Um, so the first one is going to be the rotary, <clears throat> the rotary wheel. So with any um, exhaust air energy recovery system, there are two air streams, right? So we've got the stale return air or the exhaust air coming out of the building and then the fresh outdoor or supply air coming into the building. Um, so with this rotary wheel, you can imagine that this wheel is spinning clockwise very slowly. And um, this wheel also has these really small micro channels and they're usually made out of aluminum and that's where the heat exchange is happening. Um, sometimes they're coated with a desiccant for latent heat transfer. Um, and that's where the total enthalpy uh, ERVs, not so much the HRVs. Um, so the way this works is if you can imagine this wheel spinning um, and it's uh, while it's in this upper hemisphere, You've got the um, you've got the return air coming through those microchannels, warming up this aluminum, and that exhaust air is going out colder than when it entered into the wheel. And then, as the wheel keeps turning, and it's now going into the lower hemisphere, um, uh, the outdoor air is now going through those same channels and picking up that heat and supplying pre-warmed outdoor air to the building. Uh, one thing that's important to note here is that these rotary wheel technology um, units must have a purge section, and that's basically to get the uh, the return air completely out of the wheel before the outside air starts coming in and supplying um, pre-warmed fresh air from outside. Um, and that's just to keep that uh, that EATR leakage rate low. Second technology is the counterflow fixed plate. Um, you can see there's this diamond or hexagonal shaped core, um, and it's made up of many small plates with microchannels of their own, and that's to increase the surface uh, of heat transfer. And so these plates alternate between fresh and stale air streams. Um, and there are a few advantages to um, a heat exchanger technology like this. Um, there are no moving parts, so there's very little maintenance. Um, it's often very easy to clean, and because they're just plates, there's a very low leakage rate. And then the last technology is the dual core reciprocating heat exchanger. Um, a, a couple of key things to note here are that there are two cores. There's a, an absorbing core that's absorbing heat. And then there is uh, an emitting core that is emitting heat. Um, and then there are these dampers inside the unit. And these dampers actually flip every 60 seconds or so to redirect the air. Um, so in this orientation, uh, in this first graphic, you'll see that the return air is coming into the unit um, and going right across to this core. So it's charging this core with heat. Um, and that exhaust air is coming out a little cooler. Um, and at the bottom, the outdoor air is actually going through this emitting core, picking up heat um, and being supplied to the building. And then those dampers flip every 60 seconds. So now this return air is being diverted to that bottom core, which is now absorbing the heat um, from that return air before it's exhausted to the outside. 
And then for the top core, that outdoor air is picking up the heat from the emitting core before it's being delivered to the building. Some advantages of this type of heat exchanger technology is that it's self-cleaning. Uh, there's no defrost needed down to negative 40 degrees. Um, this type of heat exchanger can get up to 90% sensible recovery in the winter, uh, which makes it a very good um, piece of technology for cold climates. So the third key component to VHE DOAS is going to the high performance heating and cooling uh, unit. So NIA's VHE DOAS system requirements uh, list of acceptable heating and cooling equipment can be found at betterbricks.com. And it's basically any inverter driven heat pump that meets Energy Star or equivalent minimum efficiencies. Um, and those are all allowable. So what's listed here are some of the more common system types. You can see we've got multi-zone or single zone air source split system heat pumps, uh, VRF or VRV air source heat pumps, air to water heat pumps, heat recovery chillers, um, ground source or groundwater source heat pumps. And you can find this table at betterbricks.com, but this is uh, basically the uh, minimum efficiency requirements as defined by uh, in the system requirements for BHE DOAS. Um, many of these are at Energy Star levels, but where there aren't any Energy Star recommendations, uh, NIA is basing their, um, their requirements on what's available on the market. And notice that there is um, a different type of uh, technology here, the package terminal heat pump. Um, I'm sure we've all seen those like in hotels and such. Um, so those are allowable, but only in multifamily um, and lodging occupancies. And the final key component of VHE DOAS it is right-sizing that heating and cooling equipment. Um, so this example comes from the Energy 350 uh, office, which is in Portland, Oregon. Um, so in 2020, we actually uh, we actually converted our uh, RTU system to a VHE DOAS system. And what we did was we we had two constant air volume gas RTUs. Um, and we converted that to a VRF heat pump system. And then we also added those two um, HRVs to the rooftop uh, to make it a VHE DOAS system. And by doing so, we actually reduced our cooling capacity by 41% um, and our heating capacity by 54%. And that's what I mean by right sizing um, with consideration to the ventilation units and the heat recovery or heat rejection on days of cooling. Um, we sized our, our heating and cooling system to, to serve just the, the load from building envelope losses and a little bit of what's not recovered from the heat recovery ventilator. So which buildings are ideal building types for VHE DOAS? Um, so NIA's target is um, small to medium commercial uh, new construction buildings or buildings with major renovations um, and buildings that have retrofit applications. And so we're looking for buildings that have less than 50,000 square feet, um, that have less than four floors, systems that are less complex and have fewer zones. Um, so what might that look like in an existing building? So in an existing building, the system, this VHE DOAS system replaces uh, conventional simple HVAC equipment like RTUs through a system conversion. And in new construction, it's actually included in the planning and design process from the outset. Um, there are other buildings like restaurants, hospitals, and warehouses that can use VHE DOAS, um, but they're less ideal for, for this application, at least for NIA's purposes. Um, and they're not NIA's target uh, building type, um, mainly because it requires much more careful analysis and design to be effective. Not that those buildings can't save energy with VHE DOAS, it's just a little trickier to get the design right. So what are some of the system benefits of a VHE DOAS system? Why would we upgrade our HVAC if it isn't broken? Well, first of all, it improves indoor air quality uh, by bringing in that 100% outside air with little to no recirculation. 
Um, and that's a really big point for NIA to make. Um, it saves energy and money. Uh, so high performance HVAC saves energy, which in turn saves money. And our field testing has shown that when we compare uh, the existing HVAC systems to VHE DOAS, VHE DOAS saves on average 48% of total building energy and 69% of HVAC energy in Northwest commercial buildings. Um, another reason we would uh, choose uh, VHE DOAS is because it increases occupant comfort. So zonal heating and cooling um, systems provide consistent indoor air temperatures across many diverse zones um, and only when those zones are calling for it. And lastly, it offers design flexibility. There is a wide variety of ERVs and HRVs and heating and cooling units that meet VHE DOAS system design requirements. Um, and it's really up to the freedom of a designer to pick the pieces that will best serve the building. And I just wanna highlight again that the um, that, uh, big system benefit here is the reduction in, in energy use. That's uh, on average 69% HVAC energy savings um, and on average 48% whole building energy savings. And that comes from 12 of our 14 um, demonstration projects. So now we'll share some results from our recent projects. What were those projects? Um, so since 2015, NIA has been involved with uh, 14 projects across Oregon, Washington, and Montana. We didn't quite get one from Idaho that round. Um, I've personally been involved with one that's reflected in our results. And outside of that, I'm involved with a few other projects that are at various stages at the moment. Um, a few highlights about these projects is that they span three climate zones. So we've got climate zone four, five, and six. Um, of these 14 projects, nine of them were offices, two were schools, uh, two were restaurants, and one was a dorm. And these buildings ranged in um, size from 1,600 square feet up to 24,000 square feet, so um, a good spread of uh, commercial building size there. Um, and what were these existing systems? So eight of these systems were packaged gas uh, rooftop units, which is very common in small commercial Northwest buildings. Um, another three were electric, electric rooftop units. And the last three were rural sites with resin, residential style furnaces. What was our involvement with these demonstration projects? Um, so we provided technical support. Uh, we deployed metering, so we we um, we took trend data of um, of power um, and also of IEQ metering. So we we took temperature and um, CO two concentrations throughout the spaces. Uh, we also did energy modeling, and we calibrated this to a building's uh, utility bills. Um, we also uh, we also used typical meteorological year uh, weather data for these models. And then we also conducted informal occupant surveys. And this is basically to get uh, the occupants um, take on what their indoor air quality was like before and after the retrofits. I just wanna highlight um, a few Oregon projects here. Um, so the first one is a Portland Law Office building. Um, and this building was a combination of private offices, um, meeting and conference rooms, different amenity spaces. Um, and it was on the second story of a heritage building. Uh, so they started with nine RTUs. Um, and the new system that they put in um, has one large VRF system and four HRVs. The results from this project was a 73% reduction in total HVAC energy use and 63% reduction in total building energy use. Another Oregon project, this is a Corvallis office building. Um, this building, they only retrofitted about 25% of the building floor area due to project budget restraints, um, but still they, they ended up with a 71% reduction in total HVAC energy use. Um, 
and then only a 39% reduction in total building energy use. And I think that's due to them only retrofitting 25% of the building floor. And they went from two RTUs to a multi-zone ductless heat pump system and one HRV. Right, so this is the Portland office building. So this is the Energy 350 office that I was talking about earlier. Um, a little bit of backstory, we've been in our office for almost eight years and we always had thermal comfort issues. And so partway through 2020, the ownership wanted to improve our, our HVAC system's ability to provide a safe and comfortable and healthy space for folks to eventually start coming back into the office. And of course, we're energy efficiency engineers, so we were also driven to find an extremely efficient solution uh, for this. Uh, so what we ended up doing was we replaced um, two constant air volume gas RTUs um, with a 10 ton VRF uh, heat pump system. Um, and we also installed two HRVs. The result from this retrofit was that 84% uh, of um, or, or we had an 84% reduction in total HVAC energy use and a 79% reduction in total building energy use, which is quite significant. And we also have a little time lapse of our building install. Okay, so this is the VRF unit going in. Oh, that's right. This also happened during the snowpocalypse. <laughs> there goes those RTUs replacing them with those HRVs. And voila, that was our retrofit to the Chidoas at the Energy 350 office building. So I wanna highlight the hot weather resilience of this system because like I said earlier, we did cut our cooling capacity by 41%. Um, and lucky for us, we did get to see um, the hottest day on record in Portland after that retrofit. Um, and so this figure shows some data from from those two hot days. Uh, so we had the first day uh, got all the way up to 107 degrees. Um, and then the second day got all the way up to 112 degrees. Um, so even on these back-to-back -back days that were well over 100 degrees, um, the office actually um, stayed within two degrees of the 75 degree set point. So you'll see here on the hottest part of the second day, there's a 35 degree delta um, between the outside and the indoor air temperatures. Um, and we only floated up to 77 degrees for uh, during the, the occupied hours that we were in the office. So it does work even if we cut our um, cooling capacity by 41%. So we did say that we reduced our um, total building energy use by uh, 79%. Um, what does that mean? Or uh, sorry, this is the HVAC energy, or no, this is total building energy reduction of 79%. So what does that mean um, if we were to look at that with other metrics? Because um, you know sometimes it's not the EUI that you're looking for. Sometimes it's 
carbon emissions, um, sometimes it's um, energy costs. So in terms of CO2 emissions, uh, we reduce our CO2 emissions by 61%. Um, and as far as energy costs go, we did reduce our energy costs by 44% by switching to a VHG DOAD system. So I've got a couple of other projects that I wanted to highlight, and these are um, Montana projects. So these are cold climate projects. Uh, the first one is Flathead Government Office. Um, you'll see that they started off with um, an electric boiler, swamp coolers, um, a six ton heat pump RTU, um, and a server room mini split. They kept the electric boiler as a backup and also the server room mini split because that was kind of standalone. Um, but they did replace uh, their swamp coolers and that heat pump RTU with two four and a half ton heat pumps and an HRV. Um, so still significant savings, 45% reduction in total HVAC energy use, um, but only a 29% reduction in total building energy use. Um, so this project didn't save as much as others, um, partially because the site still used the electric boiler to melt snow off of the roof of the line truck garage that they had. And also partially because they were replacing an existing 610 heat pump um, in the offices and it was already relatively efficient to begin with. Another um, Montana project, the Trapper Creek dorms, um, they started with five electric force air furnaces um, and switched over to five um, heat pump units and one HRV. 52% reduction in total HVAC energy use and 24% reduction in total building energy use. So I don't know about you, but we hear this all the time that heat pumps don't work in cold climates. <laughs> um, but modern heat pumps do actually, so, um, or VRF systems. So this is uh, the heat pump performance curve for what we have installed in our office. And a few things to highlight here is that um, at 25 degrees, um, this unit is still capable of delivering 122% of nominal capacity um, with a COP of 3.3. Um, so that's still pretty impressive at 25 degrees. And these off the shelf VRF systems can operate down to negative 15 degrees. Um, but let's say you're in an, an even colder climate. Um, what do you do then? <laughs> so um, there are VRF systems with something called a flash injection technology that can go to even uh, lower temperatures. So these types of systems can um, deliver 100% capacity down to negative four degrees, 70% capacity down to negative 21 degrees, and still deliver heat down to negative 31 degrees. Um, Yes, yeah, so I'll um, in the next slide I'll talk about what this um, VRF flash injection technology is that that's helping these um cold climate units. So this is um, what a VRF flash injection technology circuitry might look like. Um, ironically enough, the uh, sort of the hang up with cold climate is is that the compressors start overheating in these VRF systems. Um, so what we need to do is have this flash injection, injection circuit, um, which delivers refrigerant over to the compressor to cool it because it's working so hard in those super cold climates. Um, and because of this flash injection technology, this compressor is able to continue running and to, um, uh, to perform in those colder climates. All right, so some big picture results here. Um, this is a very busy figure. Um, this shows the baseline full building EUIs for um, our non-restaurant projects. So we've got, I believe it's 12 projects that are on this list. Um, we excluded the restaurants um, because if you can see these, these uh, baseline building EUIs range from, from what, 26 to about 122. Uh, the restaurants had baseline building EOIs that were that were up in like a thousand, like somewhere between 800 and 1500 EUI. Um, 
so we excluded them because it, it kind of just blew up the axes and it was clear that they were just not in the same class of commercial building. Um, but a key takeaway from this graph is, is you can see how it makes it difficult to just look at a building's utility bill and know how much HVAC conversion um, to a VHU DOAS will, will save. Um, a lot of this has to do with, with fairly large differences in this other category, which is the gray category. And that includes things like plug loads or or lighting or what other what other machines that are in these buildings. Um, and also differences in occupancy. So differences in occupancy, um, ventilation needs, schedules. Um, there's a lot of variability here between um, different commercial buildings. Uh, so each building and HVAC system is unique and presents unique challenges. Um, with that being said, well, we, we see an average of that 69% HVAC um, energy savings and 48% whole building energy savings. Um, and that's from those 12 pilot projects. Again, we excluded those restaurants from, um, from this result. Right. I think this is probably my favorite slide because to me this says the, I think the most significant results um, as far as uh, VHE DOAS conversion and what that might mean for energy savings. Um, so despite the wide range of the, the whole building EOIs that we saw in the last slide or last last slide before the conversion, the one where it ranged between 26 and 122, um, if we excluded those restaurants and the cold climate uh, projects, uh, we actually see a consistent post-conversion HVAC EUI of about 11.4. And, um, and of the nine projects that we show here, um, seven of them were actually within two points of that 11.4 um, average. So what does that mean? What, why is that significant? That means that if you're a building owner, in climate zone four, because again, we, we got rid of those cold climate projects. We also got rid of those restaurants. So if you're um, a commercial building owner in climate zone four and you've got an energy target, regardless of where you're starting, you know what your HVAC EOI could look like by implementing an HVAC upgrade to VHE DOAS. So regardless of what that starts off as, you can you can model your energy savings considering that your HVAC EUI is going to be about 11.4 once you're done with the upgrade. Um, so likewise, if you're a utility or an energy efficiency group trying to project the savings from an incentive program or market transformation effort, you can you can have some pretty high confidence on the savings as long as you have a reasonable idea of what the the pre-conversion system energy use is. Mm -hmm. All right, and that brings me to the end of my presentation. If you'd like to learn more, um, if you want to find some case studies or pilot report details and findings, um, you can also find the design requirements and guidelines for VHE DOAS, um, qualifying um, units. You can find our uh, compliant product list. Uh, more research, including economic and indoor air quality analyses. You can find that all at betterbricks.com. Again, my name is Gertrude Villaverde. Thanks for having me today. Um, I'll also open it up for any questions if anyone has any questions about the presentation. Well, thank you, uh, Gertrude. And, and we do have a few more uh, questions uh, uh, minutes. Uh, one thing that I, Gertrude, that I, uh, was interested in is life cycle costing, where you mm -hmm. compare the, uh, uh, you know, the sa the savings, uh, the annual savings with the initial cost. Has has any of that been? Uh, are you aware of that uh, type of analysis? Um, I'm sure it'd be very easy for us to pull up those numbers. Um, uh, as far as costs go, uh, what we're seeing out in the field is that um, these systems are costing between twelve and twenty-two dollars per square foot to install a VHE DOAS system. Okay. Is, do do you find any government support for this uh, research and uh, effort? It seems like uh, the government, uh, you know, like will support. Uh, 
solar energy installations, do they do you get any government support for this effort I, here? You know, um, so the support for this type of research comes from that alliance of those um, over 140 utilities and um, energy efficiency organizations. Um, some of those organizations are affiliated with the government, but I, I don't believe we get direct government support for this. Um, uh, since this is just market transformation, not just market transformation, but it is market transformation. And really Nia's, uh, Nia's goal is to bring energy efficient technologies into the market. Um, and I'm sure from that type of research, there, there would be government support coming out after once, um, once they see that there are these energy efficient technologies um, coming to play and that they're proven. Energy Trust of Oregon has support, I believe. I'm sorry, what was that? The Energy Trust of Oregon. Yes, yes. So we are supported by Energy Trust of Oregon, which is also another nonprofit organization. Right. All right. Any other questions? I have one question. Uh, what would you kind of uh, mean average for a return on investment? For, for these projects, because that's going to be the driving factor getting clients to buy off of them. Mm, okay, so we're talking about um, return on investment. Um, that's not something that I personally have looked at for these um, projects. Uh, we've looked at the, like I said, those costs per square foot for installing these systems, um, but it really depends on um, on the system. And I think what's important is, is depending on what the baseline equipment is that we're we're looking at comparing um, the VHE DOAS system to. Um, like there was that one project where they started off with that 610 heat pump um, ducted unit um, and it, it, it seemed like the the energy savings weren't as significant as other projects but that's because they started with um, an efficient baseline to begin with. So it really depends on the building and um, and how base of a baseline they've got. And so we focus more on the actual cost of installation. I have, uh, I have a question also. Yes. Um, those are pretty small buildings. Generally, anything less than 50,000 square feet doesn't have a facility staff on site. So it's done by contract, mechanical contract or something like that. Did you do a study of how much maintenance costs Pre conversion and post conversion, is there a significant difference? Uh, we didn't uh, look at maintenance costs um, specifically. Um, for some of the systems, we did do sort of uh, an ONM cost reduction, especially if, if uh, a site was going from, like, let's say, a gas fired boiler, and by upgrading to this system, they no longer needed that gas fired boiler. So, of course, there's a maintenance uh, cost that's that's associated with, with that boiler that's reduced. Um, uh, also with like testing and um, chemicals for that gas fired boiler. Um, but as far as maintenance goes, um, we are anticipating that maintenance is going to be um, uh, less than baseline systems, especially if it's a package RTU since these systems are, are independent of each other. Um, and they're a lot simpler and they're a lot easier to maintain, especially some of these HRVs that, that have no moving parts. I'd be very interested in seeing that. I know <laughs> that not, not a lot of contractors are familiar with this. My only experience with these are down in the Southeast where it's used for high humidity situations and it's, it's not cheaper with regards to maintenance. So oh, I, yeah, <laughs> well, because you're you're dealing with the the desk and some of the moisture there too. Yeah. Um, Scott, why don't you uh, drop your email into the chat, and I'll I'll make note of your question, and we'll get some answers out to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Gertrude. Uh, any other questions then? Appreciate you taking time to to talk to us, and uh, uh, we will be putting your PowerPoint and your uh, the and the uh, 
on, on, on our web page here. So if anybody wants to look at this, I, I know I want to look at it more closely here. There's some stuff that I really need to study. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'll provide that, uh, that PDF version of the slides for you. And thank you for having and me. The, and thank you everyone for your questions. And the video will, will also be there. And Adam, you can stop the recording now. Uh, we'll just, uh, if anyone has any questions or comments or uh, we'd like to hear from you now. And Gertrude, thank you much, so much for your, for your time. Anytime, thank you.